Well, good morning to everybody. We are going to um, pick it up where we left it last week in Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, as you recall, if you were here last week, is kind of broken up. It's, it's divided into a couple of pieces, and Christ comes in and cleanses the temple, and, and, he, and he has an encounter with a fig tree. And uh, it's the fig tree that we're going to talk about this morning and then, and then move on into chapter 12. So let's open with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Father God, we would ask that you uh, open our eyes this morning. These are difficult passages to understand as your son spoke. And we ask that you would give us your understanding of these passages, your interpretation that we might accurately apply them to our lives, that we might accurately understand you. We ask this in your name, amen. These are difficult passages. Um, uh, this particular passage uh, appears to be a little bit disjointed, and I think you'll realize that as, as we read it here. But it's the, uh, it's the passage of Christ cursing the fig tree. So if you recall from last week, he, he, has, he has entered Jerusalem, he has done the triumphal entry, and Hosanna has been called out, and people have a variety of expectations for what's about to happen. <clears throat> but then he leaves Jerusalem, goes back to Bethany, and then comes back into Jerusalem. And along that road there, he comes across a fig tree. And, and so when he came out of Jerusalem, you'll pick it up in verse 12 here, he says, on the following day when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. But, and he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. So that's his encounter with the fig tree. In essence, he curses the fig tree. And then he goes in to Jerusalem and cleanses the temple, and then he comes back out of Jerusalem and comes past the fig tree again. And this time we pick it up in verse 20. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive, if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive your trespasses. And then, in some of your translations, you will notice that verse 26 is missing. I went looking for verse 26. What happened to verse 26? My translation goes from verse 25 to verse 27. 26 is gone. And there's a verse that appears in another gospel that they believe was placed into Mark at a later date, it didn't appear in some of the original manuscripts, so they took a big eraser. Not that it's not scripture, but it didn't appear in the, in the book of Mark at that time. And so um, 26 is, is not in my translation. Um, we move on to 27. 1126. Yep, 1126. It, it is in the, in the what? In New American Standard, not in the English Standard Version. You know, I don't know about NIV, but at any rate. But it has it in brackets. Yeah, it has it in brackets saying, yeah, okay. So, he curses the fig tree, comes back the next day, the fig tree is withered. And then he has this teaching. He has, these, he, he has this teaching that he inserts into this as he is standing by that fig tree. Well, what's a fig tree? Well, I had to go take a look. I had to find a picture. That's a fig tree. Now they get really big. They get really big. And, um, but beautiful, leafy, green, almost a bush, kind of looks like a bush to start. It can eventually grow up into a, into a large tree, but those are the fruit of a fig tree, and apparently they're very good to eat, sweet, um, very, very tasty, and that's what Christ did. He went up to this fig tree looking for figs, but it wasn't in season for figs, and he still cursed the fig tree. <laughs> Wait a second, all right? So what, what's going on? Why is Christ doing this with this fig tree? I, it, 
I think you have to get back to the setting of that week. The drama of that week is not necessarily just the end of the week, the crucifixion, the resurrection. That's what we focus on, Friday through Sunday. But the drama of the week really begins as he is going to Jerusalem and he's telling his disciples, the Son of Man is going to be crucified, he's going to die, he's going to raise on the third day. These things are going to happen. I am going to Jerusalem to die. And, and so the drama begins well before he even comes into Jerusalem. Then, of course, the entry into Jerusalem and the Hosanna and everybody's excited. Well, not everybody. Religious leaders are not excited and, and they're, they're very concerned. The Romans look at him and say, are you going to lead an insurrection against Rome? What is happening with these crowds? But what is happening with these crowds? And I, and, I, and I say the drama that is occurring that week is really a drama of God and Satan. That's really the drama. That is what it, that's, that's the umbrella that, that goes over all of these events that we're seeing. It is a spiritual battle that is happening that week. Who will win? Who will win? And so you've got the Pharisees coming up and questioning, and you've got Pilate involved, and you've got, you've got the, the, the Herodians, and you've got all the crowd who wants to make him king, and you've got the disciples off to the side, and all of these people are involved in this spiritual battle. So when he goes into the temple and cleans out all of the money changers and the people selling, which is, which is, which is what he does here in chapter 11, that's the spiritual battle. He, he says, you, you have turned my place where God should be worshipped into a place of business, into a place of thievery. It is anything but worship. And you are in the process of rejecting the Son of God. So when you play the whole week out, of course, all of these conversations and the turning and the cleansing of the temple and the and the cursing of the fig tree and and all the things we'll see in in the next few in the next few verses all of this is taking place who is going to win this battle the spiritual battle who is going to win and then christ is killed christ is killed at that point then what I mean, you can imagine the deflation that occurs in people's minds as they see this spiritual battle and he's, he is battling with the religious leaders and the religious leaders win. Christ is killed. And then, of course, he rises from the dead three days later. I mean, it's a huge, it is a huge cosmic battle that is occurring. So it is within that context that you've got to put this fig tree not just walking down the road and going, oh, look, there's a fig tree and there's no fruit on it. Blam, withers next day. It is, within the it is within the spiritual battle. And that is important because when he comes to these verses that talks about prayer and, he, and moving mountains and all of this, it is within that context that you have to understand those verses. What is, what is he involved in during that week that he, would, that he would speak this way to his disciples. He is involved in a life and death battle. Now, he knows he's going to win, but nobody else does. I mean, he, he knows where it's going. He knows the end of all this. He has predicted, he has prophesied that, but nobody else does. And so they're watching this going on. They're listening to his words. They're seeing him enraged. They're seeing him very strong in his words to the Pharisees and the Herodians that come up here. But it's a, it is a battle that is going on, and it is a spiritual battle. Ken? Not having looked at it that way before, I find it fascinating to say, well, what if the devil had won? Would he not have been crucified? Well, Would he uh, have been accepted yeah. as a king? Right, what? Yeah, right. Had they not rejected him? Yeah, that's always the question. What if they had not rejected him? Well, I, you can't answer it because we don't, we don't know because there have been many prophecies of this happening. So regardless, they have rejected him. So first question here, why did Mark interweave the narrative of the fig tree with Christ's appearance in the temple? So, you know, he curses the fig tree, then he cleanses the temple, then he comes back to the fig tree. 
and I think it's what we just talked about. It is, it is because it is part of the same narrative. While it looks like it's disjointed, it is part of that same narrative. This spiritual battle that is going on and the fig tree becomes symbolic of, of whatever this battle is that is occurring. So what did the fig tree and the fruit represent? You know, John 12, 35 to 38 says this. So Jesus said to them, the light is, and this is right before this week, the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him, so that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? So, first of all, you have to, you have to go back to what is happening. They still do not believe in him. Now, there were some that did. But the, but the masses, the masses, the, the, the John the Baptist calls out, repent, turn, you know, turn, get ready. The day of the Lord is here. As a nation, they didn't turn. As a nation, they did not repent. They did not believe. So there's your context. Unbelief, unbelief, rejection, rejection of him. So now he comes up to this fig tree and he says, no fruit, okay, no one will eat from you from this tree again. And the next day it, it's withered when they come back. So what's the fig tree and what's the fruit? Lonnie? Yeah, so the fig tree is symbolic of the nation, the nation of Israel, the one that has borne no fruit, right? No, no fruit on the fig tree. Now, I think that the issue of, well, it wasn't the season is kind of an aside here. The fact of the matter is there was no fruit on the fig tree. And that was, and that's, and so when Christ then cursed the fig tree, no one's gonna eat from you again. The nation of Israel, you have had your moment. You have, you have had the opportunity to accept the Son of God. You have had the opportunity to repent, and it didn't happen, and no fruit. Instead, I go into the temple, and I see your fruit. There it is. You're, you're robbing from God. There's your fruit. And so this, so this fig tree then becomes a symbol of the nation of Israel. The cursing becomes his turning to the nation of Israel and saying, you have had your chance. Now I'm not talking end times, I'm not drawing any parallels with that. I'm just talking about right then, he was, Christ was turning elsewhere because the nation of Israel had rejected and bore no fruit. And there was plenty of opportunity for that to happen. So, tree looked good, lots of religious activity going on, leaves, green, looked good, no fruit, not bearing fruit. Jim? In the Bible, which does include verse 26, uh -huh. in the Genesis, but under that, it said, uh, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. Oh, okay, saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. Yeah. 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 The leaves didn't just fall off. The whole the whole tree withered. Yeah. Yeah. Terry. Yeah. Yeah. He wanted fruit, right? He was hungry. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. 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 The weeping. The weeping that Christ exhibited when he came to Jerusalem and looked and, and sat on that Mount of the, 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 the Mount of Olives and looked over at Jerusalem and wept and said, oh, 
you could have had it all. Ken? In thinking about that, my first thought was the leaders of the nation, not just the nation, because that's who had rejected him, and that's what the fight was, the evil and the good. Yeah. But yet, looking at the whole nation, is that perhaps why then through the Dark Ages and even up until 100 years ago, the Christian church condemned Jews, and truly condemned Jews, is perhaps because of that. Oh, there's been, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, One more thought. Yeah. From the roots, from the roots up, that yeah. means the roots weren't withered, or at least you couldn't tell. Yeah. So is that the roots of the Jewish nation? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. You know, one of the dangers of these, of, of, of I say the symbolism of this is that you can, uh, I remember one of, my, one of my professors many years ago says, you know, you, it, it's a, it, these parables sometimes that you read, don't, don't try to get them to walk on all four legs. You know, it's like, don't, don't take it down to the very last detail of it and try to draw something out of it. They saw this, fig tree wither, there was no fruit on the fig tree, he cursed it and said, that's, that's it. But it's within this context. So now he teaches something. So now, within that context, Peter, in verse 21, remembered, he saw this fig tree and said, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. Now, what was Peter saying when he said that? What, what do you think his... What do you think his, I mean, it almost sounds surprised. Look, hey, we walked here yesterday and that fig tree had leaves on it and looked good and now it's, it's withered, almost a surprise. That's, what I, that's how I would read it. He was, he was surprised that it had that of an immediate impact on, on, this, on this fig tree. And so Christ's response to his surprise is, have faith in God. Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, what, what mountain, right? I don't think we know. It may be, maybe the Mount of Olives, maybe the Temple Mount. But, but right there, I mean, you know, we know that Bethany, you can see, the, you can see Mount of Olives. I mean, you're, you're, you're one, two miles radius coming out of Jerusalem there to Bethany, so you're not... You're not far. So Mount of Olives, Temple Mount, but regardless, truly I say to you, whoever says to the mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that, that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Now, in our hermeneutics 101, we know that we interpret scripture by other scripture. We have to have the whole of scripture to understand some of the obscure passages. And what we know this doesn't teach is is that, that God is some sort of a genie in a bottle and you just pray and if you, as long as you believe, as long as you believe, you get whatever you want. Scripture doesn't teach that, so that's not what this passage is teaching. There's many other passages that we could go to that, that says, if you will, you know, those types of passages. So um, we know it doesn't say that. So then within this context of spiritual battle, is he turning to his disciples and saying, what you are witnessing before you is a raging cosmic battle of God and Satan. And I'm telling you, have faith in God. In that, in that cosmic battle where God has won, he has overcome the world, your prayers in, in that context of a cosmic battle is what God desires. He desires to see that ultimate victory. He desires to see Satan ultimately conquered. He's, he desires to see us victorious in that spiritual battle. And within that context of, this isn't just a tree beside the road that you go zap, but rather it is within that context, if this is representing this spiritual battle, and your prayers within that spiritual battle are heard, are heard by God. So again, not ripping this out of what is happening in this week, but rather placing it within that, having just driven the people out of the temple because of turning it into something it was not to be, 
he now turns and he's within that context talking to the disciples. If you, if you say, and literally, probably not, but it's large spiritual battle that we're engaged in. And God desires us to be engaged in that spiritual battle. We're in it. We're soldiers in it. We're taking up the armor of God in our Ephesians passage every Sunday. Yeah, Ken? Very interesting. The Greek word is R-A-O. We lift it up, not taken away. Oh, the mountain to be lifted up. Yeah, yeah. Then, Joe. We have, a, we have Jesus who's seen as a healer, you know, as a peacemaker. And now we see the fig tree and we see him going into the temple and acting very human. Yeah. Showing his anger, showing, you know, he's unhappy. Right. Making things happen. Yeah. And I, I, it's interesting to me that the humanity increases here outwardly. So he's, he's given a message to his disciples. You know, somebody who's always, always, always one way, either mad or happy, when they, they come at you from a diff, completely different angle, it's mm -hmm. like, he's serious about this. He's dead serious about so, this, you know, yes. There's a, there's a very strong yeah. message in this big for the enemy, I think, yes. in the temple. Yeah, the temple, yeah. It's not in Jesus' nature to normally do those kinds of things. Right. My right. But it was a battle. He was at war that week, and really his whole ministry, he was at war. But he stayed in Galilee so much of that ministry, not coming to Jerusalem, which was really the hotbed of the antagonism and the religious leadership and, and Rome and all of that. And so his ministry in Galilee kept him away from this. But when he came to Jerusalem, he was ready to do battle. He was, he was ready to fight. Tom? Our, our small group was, was looking at this verse uh, a couple weeks ago. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And uh, uh, the easy answer as to what the tree represented was uh, the nation or mm -hmm. the, the leadership. But since Christ did this away from those people, the only people that were there were, were mm -hmm. his followers. Right. And, and maybe a few other stragglers. But right. So... Jesus picks out this tree, so he must be wanting to make a lesson to his to his, to his followers. His followers. Yes. And so uh, the lesson there is, you know, he says, you know, if if you believe, you yes. can do this. Yes. And so the the thought that I had was, this tree is like you followers here. It's out of season, but you should never be out of season. You should have fruit all mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you don't, yeah. uh, then, then you're no use to the kingdom. Well, his desire is for us to bear fruit. Absolutely. His desire is for us to bear fruit. And, and, and of course, what he's doing now is he's turning to the Gentiles. I mean, he's, he's, he's turning away from the nation of Israel for a period of time, and he is opening it up. To the, to the Gentiles. And he's, about to, and he's about to pronounce something on Jerusalem itself that, 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 that will indicate the destruction of Jerusalem, of course, in 70 AD. So when he turns to this tree and withers the tree, he is also prophesying this, this judgment that is now going to come upon the nation as a result of not bearing fruit, not receiving the Son of God, not repenting, not turning, and, but continuing to, con continuing to look good, but not bearing fruit. Let me, let me read you something which, which I thought said it well. If the temple in Jerusalem was not immune to judgment, then neither is any other enclave of power. God can be trusted to judge impartially. So when he turns to the disciples and says, if you believe, you, you, can, you can say to this mountain, be taken up, right? He is, he is whatever, whatever. And, and, and I guess this is one of the questions here is, what, is, what are they referring to when they, when they refer to whatever? Whatever you ask in prayer. Well, if it's within the context of God's judgment, it is within the context of of the enclaves of power that he just saw there in Jerusalem. 
And I think he's saying to us as, as believers today, our engagement in the spiritual battle that we're involved in is one that is, is the most important battle to God. We, we, we pray for fix our car and heal our bodies and, and be good to grandma. And all those things are very important, but the cosmic battle that we're involved in, he is saying to us, you can do great things through prayer. Great things. You can move mountains. You can, you can say to enclaves of power, be gone. Uh, it, it, is, it, it should be empowering. It should be a little unnerving that we would be involved at that level of battle. Sharon? Yeah, I mean, that's amazing. I mean, it just hit me now when you're saying that, that that's what this is saying. And it is so true, you know, that's, that was a battle. And that's kind of what spiritual warfare is all about. I mean, with, because we are believers and we can just, you know, in the blood of Jesus Christ, you demonic spirits have to leave. They leave immediately. They cannot even be around a second. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, I've always struggled with these verses yeah. because it's like, well, if, if I ask for, you know, whatever, and it doesn't happen, what does that say? Right. But when it says, if I take it in that context of spiritual warfare, I mean, I know personally, it's gone immediately. They are gone. We right. have that power mm -hmm. that we do not have to have that, them attacking us or whatever. Right. Yeah, the power, the power of God who has overcome is, 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 his desire is to see those enclaves knocked down. Now, what year are we in, approximately? How old was Christ? 33, 33, maybe not quite AD 33, but generally around there. I don't think, I don't think it started at zero, but anyway, about 33. So what year was the temple destroyed? 70. 70. So, he just called for it, and, and, we'll, and we'll prophesy it. It didn't immediately happen. I mean, that's the other thing you see here, is, is, is while these prayers of tear that down, don't allow that to stand before you, while his prayers were obviously heard by his father, it was not immediate. The, the response was not immediate, but it was sure. And it was judgment, and it was just. It was in response to their rejection. And of course, it accomplished many things by dispersing everybody out of Jerusalem and scattering the gospel across the world. But it was, but it was a judgment that was given to them. So then now he adds this forgiveness passage, which appears once again to kind of jump jump out of, out of nowhere, but, but he says, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you've received it, it will be yours, verse 24, and whenever you stand praying, forgive, if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also, who is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. So think about this. <clears throat> had he left it without that, that part, had he left it without forgiveness in there, what would have been the disciples' understanding? I know what my understanding would, would have been. It would have been, I got the power. I got the power to call down judgment on you. I've got the power to zap that fig tree. I got the power to declare that enclave out of here. And then he says, oh, don't forget judgment and mercy. This is the totality of God, judgment and mercy. So while the disciples are, are told, pray, believing, the enclaves will be knocked down. It will be overcome. Believe. Then he adds the forgiveness. And you see, you see, the, you see both of those, of those dominating characteristics of God, of judgment and mercy, in this, in this passage of the fig tree. So it's not a matter of walking around and zapping with the power of God, 
but it's it's it is it is with it is with humility that we stand and 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 join with God in this in this cosmic battle. For forgiveness is necessary for us, as much as forgiveness was necessary for the Jews in Jerusalem at that time, and they chose not to avail themselves of that, but rather to experience only the judgment, only the justice of God. Yeah. He's the Lord who right. created it, and it didn't. Yeah. So it, it always seemed kind of a dichotomy to me. Be, I don't know if that's the right way to look at it. Yeah, I don't know either, because that might be taking it too far in that, in that you know, it was out of season. Um, it, it, it was out of season, the point being that it, it, it had no fruit. That, I, think, I think that was the main point. I know what you're, I know what you're saying, but... So... The curse on the tree, I mean, the, the, was a response of judgment. The curse on Jerusalem, the curse on the, on the mount, on the temple, was a response of judgment, not a response of revenge. Our, our, our prayers are not revenge, they're justice. They're, they're a cry for God's justice to be exercised, for him to be glorified in that way. So now he, he has an encounter, and we'll move on, to the encounter with the Pharisees, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. The whole gang is there. So verses 27 through 33, and they came again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him, and they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things, or who gave you this authority to do them? Jesus said to them, I'll ask you one question, answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? But shall we, but shall we say from man? They were afraid of the people, for they all held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. So what does Jesus' reply to the question of the religious leaders indicate about their motivation for asking the question? What were these things that the religious leaders referred to in their question? And what answer did they want from Christ? And why didn't he answer their question? There's a lot of questions there. All right. What does Jesus' reply to the question of the religious leaders indicate about their motivation for asking the question? Why were they asking the question? It was a trap. What did you say? Trying to trip him up, okay? What what did they want him to say? Okay, they were still they were still trying to get him under some charge so that they could they could have him killed. Once he claimed any authority other than Rome or or the or them, he was setting himself up to be in his reign. Okay. Okay. Under whose authority? If he if he'd answered Rome's authority, or if he'd answered. God's authority, he could have run afoul in either one of those answers, okay? What did they want him to answer? Did they want him to, what, what, would, what, would, have been their, what would have been their answer? And, and these things, these things, these things, what do you think they were referring to, these things? What was the most immediate thing on their mind that, that had just happened? The temple, right? The big event in the temple. You know, whose authority, you know, who died and made you king, right? Whose authority do you have to come in and turn over these tables and mess up our system? So when you've got, when you've got the, as they line them up here, the chief priests, the scribes, the elders, they ran the temple. They ran all of the religious. They were the ones that, that Rome would come to to do deals, to try to keep the people under control, all of that. 
These were the ones that were in charge. Whose authority? Well, not their authority. I mean, they would have seen themselves as having that authority. So under whose authority? Because obviously you didn't come and ask us. So whose authority are, are, are you operating under? They controlled it all, oversaw the resolution of legal disputes, administered the political and financial affairs, and his actions the previous day was a direct attack on their leadership. Ken? Well, I think they wanted him to say under God's authority, but uh, if he had, then I don't know what power they would have had to attack him on that. Okay. Well, and it could have gone into blasphemy, you know, that they would have charged him with that. Dave? Yeah, any answer might have worked. Right. Any answer might have worked. Yeah. Yeah. Or whatever human institution or and it would have worked. Yeah. It it clearly though was not an honest question, right? I mean they weren't they they were not they were not at that point saying, Are you really the Son of God? We really need to know this because if you are then we'll just turn from everything we've been doing and we'll just worship you. It wasn't an honest question, it was it was trying to, to trap him. And so why didn't he answer their question? Because it was not an honest question. It was not, they were not seeking. They, they were not seeking, um, trying to determine whether or not this really was the Son of God. And of course, he trapped them. They, 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 couldn't answer, they couldn't answer his question that he turned on them, or they would have gotten into trouble, so it just went silent at that point. Moving on to the next strategy of, of how to trap Christ. You know, one of the questions, of course, is, you know, so how must we approach how must we approach Christ if we see Christ behaving this way in a question that is not honest how much how must we approach Christ then in in the verse of course that came to mind was in James 4 6 and then verse 10 but he gives more grace therefore it says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. It is, I mean, it's, they did not approach with humility, obviously. They approached challenging. They approached with this assumption that they are the authority. How dare you do this? How dare you do this? How dare you, how dare you, you, you challenge our authority? Whose authority do you have? And of course, <laughs> the answer was <laughs> my father. But it wasn't an honest question. It wasn't, it wasn't sought. Last thing I want to leave with you from this, from this passage, and we'll, we'll, we'll pick it up chapter 12 next week. But last thing I want to leave with you is I want to go back to that prayer. I want to go back to that prayer about the, these enclaves of power. I think that we as a small congregation here, have a spiritual battle that we're involved in. We desire to see God's grace shared with the world. That is the last thing Satan wants to see. That is, that is, that is something that he hates. And so we should not be surprised if along the way we find some things in our road that we stumble over, that we have to climb over, that we have to blast out of the road, whatever it might be, but in the desire to do God's will, in the desire to create an environment, to create a, an opportunity that more can hear of God's grace, that we have got prayer, that we must be actively engaged in prayer, that this is not a, a battle that is occurring in Omaha, Nebraska, that has something to do with 10606 Burt Circle, it is cosmic. It is way beyond us. It is, a, it is a spiritual battle that we're all engaged in. And so the comfort that you gain from a passage such as this that says that whatever, 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 whatever enclave of power that is out there that does not want this to happen, we pray, we pray, believing, knowing that God wants, God wants his grace shared. And how he determines to do that, he will show us, but he wants his grace shared. 
And so we do this. We do this. We engage in it every day. We continue to pursue what God, wa what God wants for the world, what God wants the role for us to play in that. It's so much bigger than um, sometimes what we see in front of our face. Much bigger. Let's close in prayer. Father, may you build that faith into our lives that we can pray.